welcome everyone. We're uh, delighted to have with us tonight uh, John Wally to talk about this uh, fantastic exhibition we're standing in or sitting in uh, called Short Stories. Um, so we have people here live. We also have uh, we're live streaming on Facebook. Uh, so for those of you on Facebook, if you want to ask a question, just type it into the comment section. There's a bit of delay between us here in the gallery and you watch it live, so I would encourage you to type in the question when you have it, because if you wait until the end, we may not see it. Um, also, if you ever miss any of our, for everybody, if you ever miss uh, any of our artist talks, we post um, recorded versions of them on our YouTube channel, and so if you want to keep up with us, just subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll let you know when there's a new video available. Um, hopefully everyone saw the review of the show that was in the Press Herald this Sunday by Jorge Arango. It was a fantastic piece by Jorge, we thought. Mm -hmm. um, but in case you didn't, uh, I certainly encourage you to check out the full review, but I'd also like to read a few excerpts that I think uh, really perfectly capture John's work in this show in particular. So quoting Jorge, uh, his skill is frankly astonishing. His work is so meticulously painted or drafted with graphite the textures of wood, leather, metal, grass, twine, and pine cones take on a visceral presence. The illusion of three-dimensionality is thoroughly convincing. All this, despite the extraordinary perfection and skill, is not particularly new. So what is Wally's innovation? That lies in the depth he brings to the genre. Wally's work transmits warmth, melancholy, and or nostalgia, as well as a poignant sense of the passage of time. Or, to use John's own words, he responds to the beauty that speaks soft. So now before I turn it over to John, just a bit about his, a bit about his background. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, and currently lives in Midcoast, Maine, as probably everyone here already knows. Uh, he received his BFA from uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. His work is in numerous private, national, and international collections, including the Georgia Museum of Art, the Otto Nauman Collection in New York City, and the Alfred Bader Collection in Milwaukee, just to name a few. His publications include John Wally, American Realist, and John Wally in New Light, a 30-year retrospective book of his drawings. And in addition, uh, John was featured on the television show, Phil Green's Maine. And with that, I will turn it over to John. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you for coming tonight, especially with the rain and everything. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Um, so tonight, I. Um, prepared something to share, a little different than I did a couple years ago when we had a gallery talk. Um, and what I wanted to, to kind of talk most about, and then I can go around if there's any questions about the individual pieces, was the process of where we, and I say we, because Ellen is my collaborator. She's like my stage designer almost. So these are somewhat collaborative efforts um, in the planning. and. So I was going to see, let you know kind of where all this stuff comes from. I thought that might be interesting. It's something I haven't ever talked about before, necessarily. And, um, so to start with, um, I put together a few pictures um, about, and we could do the first one. OK. This is a very quick little section about, well, how many years ago was that? 1981, two, however many years. Is that 40 years already? Oh, wow. Well, 40 years ago, I um, was living in Pennsylvania for five years. I was working in an orphanage. It was a program for kids, 50 kids, 25 boys, 25 girls. It was on a working farm in the middle of nowhere. It was the endless region, endless mountain region of northern Pennsylvania. And um, it was up a long valley, a beautiful piece of 300-acre land uh, with like a 600-foot mountain behind it. It was wonderful. And I fell in love with it when I first saw it, and I thought I'd love to work here and then have time to paint. So I did an art therapy program with the kids when, once they were home from school throughout the whole evening. But when they were at school all day, that was my work time. So the uh, owner of the home, the director, said that there's a barn that we have on the property we're tearing down, and if you want any of the wood. So I took what I could, and it was like a really old barn. I built a studio out in the cow pasture near my house. And that was my dream come true. <laughs> and I, I missed this place so much. It was just such a wonderful little place to go and work. But when I was there is when I started doing these four by five foot graphite drawings. Did it spit? 
And the next one is that one? Okay. What's next? There we go. Uh, that shouldn't have been there. Um, this was four by five feet. And this was where the kids would do their chores and come in and just leave stuff around. So they were my stage designers then. I would just find these scenes. And I might move it like a, something a few inches this way or that way, but this was where the kids had left stuff. And um, so I, I did a whole series, like dozens of these large drawings. And then I started, um, I had collected a lot of the old stuff that was in the valley there, and I would pose the um, more posed still life that I would have more control over. And this was in a small house where it was owned by two women doctors and, um, who had died, and they left this house as a place, like a historical mo monument kind of place. And when you went in this room, and then walked in the next room, there was a bed with a little nightstand, and there was a stack of letters from Helen Keller to these two women. They were just sitting there, and I, could, I was reading them all. I was working on this. It was amazing. So that's, um, that was another piece where I brought the pairs, but everything else was pretty much there. And this was some other tinware with wild apples that I picked off the tree outside. So, so that's kind of what I did there. And now it says the new studio, it should say now. <laughs> But um, I have a bunch of images here of, of where the studio is now. And, and this is where I go in with Ellen. And uh, in thinking of a new series of works to do, I go in there and um, we just go around and look at the pieces. And how these pieces, the objects, wound up in there is Ellen and I frequent flea markets, antique shops here in Maine, um, barn sales, uh, what do you call it when the yard sales? Yard sales. And we don't, we're very selective, but there's certain objects you see that just have such a story to them. And we, something, either they're free and then it doesn't have too, doesn't have to have too much of a story, but uh, <laughs> if we have to pay for it, then it has to be something with a real story. And so most of the stuff we did buy. So it's, it's got real character to it, the objects. And they become like the, the subjects of future artworks. And so we'll, we'll go around and find out what pieces right now are really interesting, we find very interesting, and um, we'll select them out, and then on a couple of tables, we'll begin playing with the object, and then, then the thing would be like the background, and um, I have a lot of these pieces of wood, and in the box there, you'll see a piece of slate, which is the background for this piece, and uh, this, I think, is some of the background for that, but I kind of changed it a bit. Um, but anyhow, I have dozens and dozens of these. And so that's something we use as, as background for some of the pieces. Um, so the, the studio is kind of like shelves and shelves of objects that could be potential subjects for a painting or drawing. And um, it's a matter of just what we find really interests us at a particular time. And we'll make like a few hundred possible compositions. And after each one's made, I'll take a picture of it so we can remember what it was. And then after a day or two of doing that, we'll go through all of the pictures and see which one is having just now a long range of them, which ones have potential, which ones don't, which ones are we trying too hard to make something happen, or, or what backgrounds are really jiving with the object. You know, it's, it's a process of kind of discerning. And it's tiring. You're, you're constantly trying to maximize the impact of the story that you're seeing this thing has that you want to tell. And, um, so after that, we then cull down the large number of possibilities to the, the chosen few that we really feel good about. And, um, and then it's a matter of beginning to work. And they, it always changes when you're painting it. It doesn't really remain as it was particularly. But um, so that's kind of the process of coming up with compositions. And um, let's see. Um, and Ellen is in the theater. Ellen is an actor. She's an incredible actor. And she also is a great stage. She's good at staging our home. The kitchen, every room is just staged with these beautiful objects. So um, she's a wonderful assistant for me. We work together on some of these. She'll come in and say, well, she's, she's able to she pull me back from getting a little too excited and overboard one way. And she'll say, well, you know. So it's, it's, she's a really big help to me that way. And you told me to tell the truth. I, that's a, I tell the truth, and then when she offers the truth, I'm like, wait a minute. And she's like, 
you can't have it both ways, sweetheart. Um, but, um, and somebody asked me earlier today about lighting sources. Like, how do you light these things? And in the morning, there's usually sunlight that comes in. And the sunlight you'll see in that little painting over there in the corner hitting the, the background I had it on. Um, but for the most of them, I have a plexiglass panel that I've sanded one side of with very fine sandpaper, so it's clouded over and it's translucent. And with sunlight or sometimes artificial lighting, you can have this be between the objects and light source. And it puts a beautiful soft light. A friend of mine who's a, a really good photographer, he taught her this whole life in Chicago. I went to school with him, he said, John, I was looking showing him these things you could buy. It's like $1,000, but it's great. He goes, John, just go get a, a white shower curtain that's like um, translucent. It's like not clear, but it's not clouded over too much. He said, for like $4.99 at Rennie's, you can pick one up and stretch it, and that will make a beautiful big panel of clouded light that you could use. So that's another option I use. And, um, so it's a way you can control the light and maximize the impact and um, the shadows. And so there's a lot to it, planning each one. Um, and then once the painting is started, then a teacher that I, I really enjoyed once said, when you first look at a piece, uh, you're, when you set up your stall and you look at it, once you look at it and, and look at it for a minute or two, you're no longer seeing the colors that are really there. That you, he said, you have to like, look at it, and before you even process what it is you're seeing, you will develop the skill of kind of catching an intuition of this color that when you look, it's not there. But when you first look, you thought you saw the hint of it. It's hard to explain, but it's, he, he, was explain, he explained it very well. But I started doing that. and. It's amazing the colors that you, you don't actually see if you concentrate, but when you include them, the ones you do think you see. It's like a Rorschach test where they say, what do you see? Or the test where they go, the guy will tell you a word and you have to respond instantly with another word and it's supposed to tell something about yourself. Well, the same kind of thing with the color. It's like, just get the first imagined flicker of, of and sometimes it's the fact that the colors that there you're seeing, it's complementary color. But it's how the eye works. But anyhow, I try to be open to that and include colors that, that they're not discernible by really concentrating. It's more like just kind of being a, a little liberal with your interpretation of what you're seeing. And it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but that's what I do anyhow. And, um, and then the rule of 95 to 105, a man we knew said that, because they were asking him, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when a piece is done? And some of you might, with work you do, say, when, when is it finished? And he said, well, there's a 5% short of 100% and 5% over. If you land in that range, you're all right. But if you reach 100, then you push it to 105, and then you keep going, you kill it. But if you don't develop it enough, it's missing something. So it's kind of intuitional, but it's like trying to recognize when you've landed at that spot. And Ellen helps me time, sometimes to, to I'm, I think I have a long way to go. And she said, I think you're there, I'm pretty close, you know? So it's, it's very helpful to have a second voice. Um, yeah, so that's that. My sister, Barbara, um, was an artist as well. And she, I lost her a few years ago. But she sent me this book a long time ago, and it's um, short stories. So the, the show has a little bit to do with my feelings toward her. And it's, what I loved about the book is these stories are like, like Tolstoy and you know, known authors. And they're like little glimpses into a situation or a person's life, maybe an evening or even half an hour. And they tell you this wonderful description of what's happening. And it leaves you with questions about how they arrived at this position and then what happened next. And it's just like a slice of life. And of course, as, as these artists are able to just put the pathos in there and the, the questions, it's, they're wonderful. So um, I, with these pieces, I had in mind to do little things that would prompt someone to 
have a story that they got a part of a story and then they could take it and think about it and be, have it impact them. But um, so that's where that idea came from for this show. Um, anything else on, on that part? That you, pretty good? Yeah. So that's kind of how, you know, we have this stuff all out like this. And as I walk around during the, you know, in the morning, I'll just look at stuff. And one day, something that's been sitting there all along catches your eye, and that becomes the star of the, of the next piece. Um, so it's, and some, and the interior books, sometimes I've done still lifes against some of the old type that's inside some of the books. It's just wonderful to find um, combinations of things that help you tell the story for that particular piece. And the other thing is like here, to have two similar but different, they're like in the same family, but they're different, but they're similar. I love that like thing going on and, um, just a couple like that, like this, well, yeah, the, the, the scrapers up there, the putty knives. It's like um, similar but not similar. And this, these were three little jars we bought with these met, uh, lead weights, lead shot, I guess, were in them. And uh, I think they're salt and pepper shakers, but they, people were storing their, their stuff in there. And I call this one species because it's like the same, um, same genus, is that the word? Yes. I heard the word genus, thank Correct. you. <laughs> but different species, and I just love that idea, because you know, when you're growing up, they teach you about all that stuff, and obviously I forgot most of it, but um, so that's, that's a nice thing to do, to play off things, and then to have something that's kind of absurd, like um, hacksaw blades, and a thing they make fishnets with. It's like, it does, <laughs> what's that all about? And <laughs> so, <laughs> I say, well, I don't know, <laughs> you go figure it out. But it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun to have things sometimes that are just kind of wacky. And it can speak to somebody. And there's always somebody out there that thinks the same way you do, or doesn't think the same way you don't think. But whatever it is, it, it's, sometimes you can just follow those urges and get it out of your system, and it's fun, you know. But, um, and then some are just nature items that I love. And so, um, so anyway, this was just to kind of show you from where these particular still lifes have come from and where all the future ones are in there somewhere too. And um, we're now at the point in life where we're thinking of our two sons and they're going to inherit all this stuff. And I think it's time to start getting rid of some of it because they're going to be like, what did you, what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but these are like uh, a cabinet full of nature objects that we've either found or, or you know, people, once you have a collection, people come by with stuff like, oh, we heard that you like seashells. And um, those are like clay marbles that they used to make in the colonial days from just the, the, the clay in the banks of rivers near us. And, um, but what's nice about having a quantity of objects is you can tweak, like there's always something that's going to work. And if it's not that one, it's something similar to it. There's enough you can choose from. You're not dependent on it. Well, I, have to, I wanted to do a, a drawing of a seashell, and I only have one. Well, we have like 500, so you have to really <laughs> tweak it. And bees' nests and bird nests and things. So. And in my college was a woman named Miss Lawrence, and she was in her 80s then, and she had the Nature Lab. It's at Rhode Island School of Design, and it's room after room, like twice the size of this gallery, and it's all shells with stuff she collected over the, her lifetime. And it's just like this. And so I think she infected me when I had her for a teacher. <laughs> it was a drawing class, and she, used to, she was a real classical drawing teacher, and. I really loved her. She was like a grandma. She'd come over and you know, comment, and she was pretty tough on you, but she was really nice. But um, she ran that place, and it's still there, but it's just not the same without her there. So um, in, term, in terms of media, the paintings are done on egg tempered panels, except for the oil paint. That's on a gesso panel with acrylic gesso. But this is a, a masonite panel where I put about, I think about eight layers of um, you take marble dust, which is like white powder, it's calcium carbonate, and you, you buy it 
in a sack. I got a 50 pound bag of it. And um, you get a double boiler and you make basically like jello. You know how you make jello? You put the gelatin in and it turns kind of like creamy texture. Um, this is um, called rabbit skin glue, but it's not made by rabbit skins anymore, but it's got a name from that. You, and you mix that up in a double boiler so the, it's hot. And then as it's hot, you pour in a, a really, you'd be surprised, an incredible amount of the white powder. I mean, it's like, you think, how is all powder going to fit in there? But it does. And then you wind up with about a gallon of this hot gesso. And you apply the layers on both sides. And I usually have about 20 panels. So you start with the first and let it dry. And by the time you finish all 20, you come back and do the second layer the opposite direction. And it usually takes like from 7 in the morning to like 11 at night to get them all done. And um, then when you're, you're done, I don't know if you can see it, but you sand them. And it's just this, you get this, I guess I didn't sand this fully, but you get this beautiful surface that um, is like chalk. And then you, um, once you have those panels, you take um, egg yolk. It, I didn't make a film strip for this because I can tell you. You just take a crack an egg, get the yolk in your hand, so it's just the yolk, and then you dry it off by going back and forth. And once the yolk sack is dry, you can pick it up like this, and then you puncture it into a baby food jar. And then you add, if there's that much yolk in there, you add that same volume of water distilled water and you stir it up, put your eyedropper in there and then as you paint during the day, we have these pigments that come powdered and it's nothing in it, it's just pigment. And they come, these are different earth tones you can get. Um, a friend of mine, Nate, Carolyn knows Nate, he's gone up in northern Maine somewhere and he, he's found this iron mine or something where he goes and collects the rocks and then he comes home and grinds them up and he gave me some pigment he made so that's pretty cool and um then there's this which is has a liquid it's water added to it so it's and you see so you mix what i do is on a on a people you sometimes use cup palettes but i just use a piece of glass plate glass with white on the back and then um i mix the pigments I add them together, the color we're making, and then you put a few drops of the egg yolk and kind of work it, in, work it in with a palette knife. And then I have a little squirter, little drops of water, and you can keep that alive by adding water every little bit because it dries out um, after an hour or two. And it's very um, creamy, and you just use a very, I use a very fine brush for the detail work and a very broad brush for putting down big areas of color. And it, it sucks right into this. Like if you put it here, it just, it's instantly dry because it sucks right in and it makes a really good bond to the ground. Subsequent layers dry pretty quickly, but they don't pick up, usually they don't pick up the, un the layer underneath unless you really work the paint. So you can build beautiful layers of color by cross hatching or, um, it's a wonderful medium and uh, it's very time consuming, but um, you can apply the paint in terms of texture, you can take your toothbrush when you're done with it, and um, after you're done done with it, um, <laughs> not, not every morning, you know, um, you <laughs> just take this, and you put it in the egg yolk, and you can splatter, get some very fine splatters, or you could go like this for some like, bigger, bigger ones. That's why this um, objects that come out of my studio have paint all over them, because when you go this way, it does go that way, but then it goes that way too, so. Um, so that's that, and then they have like natural sponges or you know, production sponges that you can add texture with that. So there's a million ways to gain texture, but most of the texture I get is with a paintbrush, very fine paintbrush. So that's the egg tempera. Any questions about egg tempera? Yes. Uh, I had a customer ask the other day about egg tempera and using the yolk. Does the yolk actually stain if you're using white? The white, the color. No, very slightly. It doesn't much. And with sunlight, um, sunlight bleaches the, the yolk. yolk. Yeah, it really. But no, I, I wondered that too. Because people always say, you must use the white. And it's like, no, you know, it's the yolk. It's a protein. And it's actually like an oil and water emulsion. It's, you thin it with the water. But, and if you had like salad oil, like olive oil and water, 
and put egg yolk in it, it'll make the two just blend perfectly. Did you mean does the, the white pigment in the egg yolk turn yellowish? Is that Basically, what you mean? does the yellow stain the white at all? Yeah, or make the other colors yeah. warm. Yeah. No, it doesn't. And it's also the very thin layers of color. I suppose if you put like really impasto, which you can, it will peel off. It might show up more then, but I've never had that happen. Um, I always wondered that. But I the, other, the other question the same person asked was about subject matter choosing a um, tempera over oil for mm -hmm. a certain subject. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of. I've tried to figure that out, and it's very, for me, it's very intuitive. It's like I see what I'm putting in the paint, and the dry quality of egg tempera has this dry kind of a atmospheric. Um, the darks are never really very dark. They're dark, but they're not very dark. Um, oil can really be much more dramatic. So I think that's one of the things. It's just this very. It's a quality I've always loved in egg temper. It's very dry feeling and just kind of. Uh, do you find much of a difference? I know you can put 20 or 30 layers of egg temper. How about with oil, when you do oil paint? Are with oil find, paint? Do you find the same number of layers? Or is um, it in more opaque, is that not an issue? It's probably less layers in the oil paint. And um, like with this, like what I, I don't know if I brush here, but with this one, for example, I. I hold the brush this way and let drag it and just like paint fall off the brush. So it's it's more of a the color there is the color I wanted there in egg temper. That color might take five layers to create, you know. So oil you can pretty much like you said, make it yeah, make it right there. Yep. So and uh, but that's that's kind of intuitive for me. I see things. In this show I decided I was doing most of the paintings throughout from last summer through the winter, and most of them I didn't finish until this like, late winter spring. They all developed simultaneously. Um, each day I'd work on maybe a different one or a couple of different ones each day. And um, a lot of that happened during the winter months, and um, I have a, what's it called, a immune system, what's that called? The, uh, compromised immune system. And um, turpentine is a no-no for me. And in the old days, I just breathed all kinds of stuff. I never thought about it. But now I have to think about that. So with egg temper, it's wonderful. Just There's no fumes or anything. Um, but when spring came, I, I worked on this oil. And I love oil. But I'm going to start doing that more in the summer months. So that's why I decided that, too, for the show. Um, anything else with egg temper? Um, a quick thing with the pencils, there's not quite much to say. I use a Stonehenge paper or, or Arches watercolor paper to draw on. And um, I have this roll of Stonehenge I brought right down the street here in 1981. And it was about this big around and about that tall. And it weighed like 300 pounds. It, when it arrived, I didn't know I ordered something that big. <laughs> so wherever I've moved over the years, I've had to carry this thing, but you can't bang it because if you bang it, dents go into the layers and you waste like 30 feet of paper if you dent it. So I have a special package I put it in, and it never seems to get any smaller, and it's, it's now about that big. But it's going to outlast me, so <laughs> call me when I'm. <laughs> but um, anyhow, I've been using that, and that's for the big drawings, that's been wonderful. Like that drawing, I could roll out a piece very big. and, and um, it's a beautiful paper, Stonehenge. And I just actually um, spoke to the man at, at uh, Legion Paper. They, they asked me to do a webinar on, on a printing process. And I mentioned that I drew on Stonehenge paper. And the man at the company there is the one who invented it. So I got to tell him, thank you, you know, because he's been at it for like all these decades. And I told him the story about the roll of paper I'm still dragging around. but. Um, Anyhow, I told them I love it. So they sent me some little pads of Stonehenge. So if you're interested to draw, try Stonehenge. You can buy these beautiful little pads. And it's great paper. And they're not paying me to say that. It's really good paper. <laughs> um, we didn't get that friendly. Um, so, so I use that for drawing on. And then in terms of applying it, you know, the sketching out the thing lightly first, 
and then starting to work, applying it, the darks, I use like a range of pencils, mostly regular pencils. And then I use, um, my father had this um, sharpener. Are you familiar with these? Probably most of you are. It's an architect's drafting thing. And you buy these leads, which you put into a lead holder. Oops, they, they usually are longer than that. And then you put it in here. I feel like I'm making uh, coffee in the old days. And then you put it like that. This just cleans it. And you have a point that you could, it's like sharper than a needle. So I love it because you can really get detail. So I use that for more of the detail stuff. And then the powder that I make in doing that underneath here, you can also buy just in a jar of graphite powder. It's, it's very, and then you can apply it to the paper with a stump or with uh, 0000 steel wool. This is really, this gives a, a gray that is so incredibly just luscious and smooth. I mean, if you rub it with a stump, you're going to see some of the texture of the paper, but this somehow sands off the texture of the paper, and it's a wonderful base to draw into. So like maybe in the um, in this one, I would have, here I splattered some of the, I put a, a guard and then I splattered, I mixed rubber cement thinner with graphite powder and it made this gray liquid. And I went outside and you splatter it and it dries instantly, it evaporates instantly when it hits the surface and you're left with these wonderful splatter marks. And then um, when it dries, you sp if you want it, that's how you want it, I spray it with fixative. And then you take some of this and you can rub gray over that to kind of settle it back in. There's a lot of ways you could just manipulate the graphite to get some really great effects. So you probably invent a lot if, if, you, were, if you go and try it. And then I just, this is a new product and I'm not getting paid for this either, but it's a little, it's an eraser. Um, isn't that cool? Um, so when I work on this, if I, wanted to work in some lights into the dark, you just go, and it's, you can make a point on it and get these little tiny erasing things. It's really nice. So that's my arsenal of tools for um, <laughs> graphite. Oh, my kneaded eraser. And this is, this is a kneaded eraser that is really good for, you probably don't know that. And, um, it's just a matter of what can I do to make marks that are going to describe that surface the best. And, and, um, and the nice thing about graphite for me is that the blacks, again, are gray. They're not black. So ink, like black, black ink, maybe would, you'd get that more brilliant drama. But I kind of like the gray range. So any questions about the graphite? Yes? You, you also mask out areas of the mm -hmm. drawing. Drawing, yeah. Right? What do you use the mask for? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, on the table, I first of all for ra for the framer, I try to make sure that it's square, because if you give them, if you don't, then they have to cut a mat. That's so. I try to you measure from corner to corner and corner to corner, make sure you get the same same exact distance and then square, hopefully. But then on the around the drawing before I do anything, I'll put I'll draw the border line very faintly and then put. You know the blue masking tape in hardware stores that is sticky but not very sticky? It's, it doesn't grip the paper if you pull it off. I put that down around the edge, but I cut paper, strips of paper this wide like, and put it this close to the edge so that the masking tape hits that line but then hits the paper. And then you wind up making everything covered except the drawing space. And then you can do whatever you want. And if you wanted to do the surface, but not that, then I, I cut a piece of paper the exact size of that. And I put little pieces of tape that I fold around and make like a little donut. And you put them in the back and plop it down. And then you can throw stuff around. So, so any, any other questions about are you, reference? Are you working from a photo? I use photos for reference. I start with them, but usually they kind of change a lot. So for lighting and for some textural things, yeah, but drawing from the real thing is really what I like to have the reference. Because there's things you see when you see the actual turning of something. 
that the photos, you lose it. I mean, you can't help it, you know, and, um, and the exposures and stuff. So um, they help as much as they help, but I usually try to, I mean, if you look at some of the objects and then what's up here, they're very, they kind of evolve and the quality that you see in there that is just, you kind of just want to put it in, so. And can I, last year, well, two, two years ago, when did you have the other exhibit? Was it um, here? You had yeah, something. yep. And what I noticed, and I, I didn't know if it had to do with what you're saying about seeing the colors, because you had some references here of your real life objects that uh -huh. were very different colors than your painting. Yeah. And was that that little moment of seeing, or did you make an a, a effort to say, I don't like this color, I'm switching them over? Yeah, it's usually I know when I'm working on it and things are happening with the color that I love and it doesn't really jive with what I'm working from. Like a lot of it's mistakes even, like you, you put a color, an underpainting in and uh, you put an overpainting that didn't work out and you scrape it off and you wind up with this thing that is not anything like the object but it's better than, the, it's, it's like it's taken its own route. So I'm very open to like chance things happening and that's why a lot of them change colors and like the oil cans, somebody asked earlier, the oil cans are much brighter than, than them, but I knew what color was underneath and I wanted it to kind of, so when it came to putting the glazes over there, I, I stopped before I would have achieved that, you know, because it just wouldn't have been the same. And so, yeah, they kind of, it's almost like they have a mind of their own sometimes and you just follow it. And um, so, uh, does that answer that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So I'm guessing um, sketches and value studies are, are not, you're just working straight from the photo. Yeah, well, I just, I do like sketches, like quick ones to kind of where I'm putting things and stuff. And, um, and some of the things I've done, partial drawings, and then started over and done the whole thing, you know? Um, so, does that answer that? Yeah. So it's called Short Stories. Mm -hmm. Would you pick one picture, one work, and tell me a story? All right. As much as I can, let me pick one. Um, well, probably that one there, those oil cans, we have many more. I probably you saw them in the pictures here, but um, I picked those three because they're the primary colors. So I thought of them as kind of like, you know, you always learn about your primaries. And then, um, then I looked at what they've been through. So the story is kind of like, in my mind, I'm imagining the three of them kind of like sitting there, having wound up from many different places in life. It's different shops, different places, and they all end up in somebody's antique store or shop where we found them. And here they are sitting kind of like discussing like three old men on a park bench, you know. <laughs> so tell me, you know, where did you get that big dent, you know? And, and, um, and then you think of people like, um, I remember when I was young that uh, bookends by Paul Simon, it was old friends bookends sat on their park bench, o old friends, old friends sat on their park bench like bookends. A newspaper blown to the grass falls on the round toes of the high shoes of the old men. Old friends, winter companions, the old men lost in their overcoats waiting for the sunshine. And then it the ends by going, uh, long ago it must be, we have, you have, long ago it must be, uh, there is a photograph, preserve your memories, they're all that's left you. It's, that poem always got me when I heard it's a song. But, and then after that, Art Garfunkel went to a nursing home and recorded these old people just having conversations and it, it, real pathos. So that was one of the things I thought about when I was doing this, just these retired old men kind of like just kind of looking back on life. And I'm getting to be one of them, you know, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> this last couple of years, I, I've become a grandfather the last few years, and I'm feeling like a grandfather more and more. And um, so, anyhow, that was what was in my heart. And this piece here, I was, um, again, it was not out of a morbid sense, but I was um, working on planning this, and there was a piece of music that arbitrarily came on. I was listening to music off YouTube, classical music, and it just skips you around. And there was a piece by a man named Dan Forrest, who it was called Requiem for the Living. 
And it just blew me away. And that's why it's called Requiem. And, um, and also because this grass is in front of our house and they come by every year with that machine that just cuts it and it falls down. And um, so thinking of, you know, being old, you think about death, you think about some of those things. And I've, I've not in a morbid sense. Really, it's not in a morbid sense, but that thought was kind of in my, in my mind thinking of this. So I had a lot of thoughts about, you know, this grass is like so full of life and next thing you know, and I think it's in Isaiah, it says man's days are like grass. And when you get old, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. I didn't used to be old. In here I'm like 30, but sorry folks, this, this thing's running out. And you think of those things more. And um, so that was kind of a lot of my story in that piece. And um, so it was done with a very hopeful, wonderful, the beauty of that, you know? And um, so, yeah. And there was so much happening with the side things going on. So anyhow, that's a couple of possibilities, but yeah. So um, I think that's what I prepared here. Um, if there's any questions about any of the work or anything else. Um, Yes. How often do you do your staging, uh, like blitzes? Um, you know, most of it's done. We take a couple days, two or three days, periodically, maybe every six months or something. But then during the in between times, I'll be walking around and they just happen. You know, you just the lighting and you see things you didn't see before. So it, it's kind of constant, but the big clumps of organized effort comes every six months a year, maybe, yeah. something like that, yeah. And that supplies enough work to start working on. Because so, it's, this show took most of a year to complete, so you kind of, I want to put that time towards something that, and you know the nice thing, if, if you do paint and draw, the process works for me because a lot of times, I have a lot of paintings I started and never finished because I didn't really plan them very well. And I, I kind of, got to a point where they, they went to a dead end and, and I, I look back and it's like, I should have done this, I should have done that, but there's it's, it's nothing to salvage. And this way I find that I usually wind up pretty confident that what I have in mind is gonna be the final product. So you're not, I don't have a whole bunch of dead ends this last year. I have a few, but not, not many. Uh, how, how would you say your work has evolved over the decades? Um, Part of it is I think I did pictures of bigger things like those early graphites, bigger scenes. And mostly I'm, I'm kind of focused more on the, the beauty in these little individual things. It's not like a whole collection of things necessarily. It's um, just appreciating this little thing, like that little plumb bob with the thing coming down um, and just getting lost in that. It's, it's more particular, I guess. That's one thing. Um, and I'm always trying to get better at capturing detail. And I look back on stuff I did like 10 years ago, and it's, I look at it and I go, oh, I, would have, I wish I could go back and like, redo that little piece of rope or something. And it's like, no, you know, that, that was then. And I mean, I like it, but it's, it's like, it's a good, I always feel like it's a good sign that you've, if you're not satisfied with things in the past, that means you must be at least you think you're getting better at what you're doing, but, so, but. What's your favorite part of painting these pieces? Do you have a place where you're really having fun? Yeah, um, the best part is, the, like the bottom part, this was like a super bright orange underneath this, for example, and laid that down, put down kind of some of the colors, and it's, it's nowhere near where it's gonna be. So it's, you, you have an idea where it's going and you kind of can project in your mind where it's gonna be, but it's not there and it's, I don't like that time. It's like the beginning of a long trip. It's like, and, um, but once you, you begin finding your way and finding the colors and seeing things that are happening and then it, it gets exciting and then you start having more days that are really exciting, you know, and, um, and then discovering why some of these lavenders and purples, uh, they really weren't there on the cone, you see the cone. But I know that when light falls, it brings out that dry purpley quality on things that are kind of oxidized. So I just kind of started doing that and it was, 
I loved it. It just and all these warm colors and those little cool things and um, and then trying to make the shadows so it really seemed that's fun, you know. But the preparation, the, the, the getting to that point is always a long slog. But it's you know it's coming. So it's, yeah, that's a good question. Yes. I did my first one of my sister, a little painting of my sister when I was at art school. There was a man named Panos Gikas from Yale that used to come up and teach it once a week. And um, that's where I learned it. And he had us do painting, so I did a painting of my sister. She has it over her mantelpiece. It's nice. And um, yeah, so, and that's, I just started that. And then I, I started doing like a regular bunch of them. I think it was like 76. So, and yeah, it's. He pulled the oil as many, have you done as many of oils as a temper, or has it always been both? I think over the last 20 or 30 years, I've done about equal. Probably a little more egg temper, maybe. Yeah. Is all the artwork in your house yours, or do you have other artists that you enjoy? Um, I have uh, a print of a beautiful painting by Lyndon Frederick. You familiar with him? Yeah, he's a main artist here. Um, what other work do we have? We have an original of Roy. We have Roy's in Florida. Yeah, we have, we have a Roy Germain. Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. Portrait of John. We do. And it's really, it's nice having them there. And we have a woman called by Gretchen. Gretchen, a friend of ours Boston. in Boston. She's a wonderful artist who. <laughs> I know, that's our problem. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. True. Yeah. If you want yeah. windows, you can't have. We have, a, we have a 1880 house, and this, the way they make the windows and everything, there's very little wall space where you can put stuff. Yeah. So we're limited. And, um, so, but yeah. And Ellen has her collections of like beautiful objects in the kitchen that's like a gallery. And that, that wall of all those little choppers, did you see the wall of choppers? That's Ellen's. So, yeah. So that's like her gallery. Her room is kind of a studio you go through, get to my room, and her room is all like creations that are of, oh man, all kinds of stuff. It's pretty nice. That's how we knew we were kind of met for each other was when we first met, it's like, I remember the first day I went to visit her, I said, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it took three years to get there, but I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I inherited the house, and then I built a studio. So I, I felt it was only fair to bring something to the arrangement. So our house doubled. It's like this is the studio. It's a small house, so it's, it's kind of nice. I felt like I did my part. Have you ever painted people? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Um, I've done a lot of older people. I was realizing most of my portraits are old people because the character, you know. Watch it, buddy. I mostly finished the portrait I'm doing in Fallon and Egg Temper, but that wasn't one of those portraits. <laughs> no, just, I, I've always had, since I was a kid, the older people are just very interesting faces. So. Yeah, I, there's a man in our town that's not with us anymore, Houston Dodge, and he was a character, but he had the most wonderful face, and I did about four or five pencil drawings of him, and um, yeah, so, so, yep. So, anything else? Yeah. Oh, curious, I think it's very cool that you have the, uh, of, of pine cone painting and the pine cone drawing. Yeah. Were you thinking of doing that intentionally for I did the drawing, yeah. and Ellen, you want to tell that part of it? I just encourage him to do the painting because I love I love the way he does pine cones so much, and I knew it would come out like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so I took her advice and I made it a little bigger, scaled it up, and and uh, in the background, I, I really honestly I I think it was this board that was kind of the initial palette of colors, but I usually would say psych like microscopically accurate to what's here, you know, that whole, is that whole off a little bit like someone's going to know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I've gotten a little more free now, and I, I didn't really complete some of the little passages, 
because I just love the pieces of color. And I think I'm really an impressionist at heart. I would love to be an impressionist next time around. So. I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as magnification, do you? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Yes, I do. Um, I got a pair of these. Um, I looked on. There's a lady that does um, restoration. She's a what do they call those people? Conservator. Conservator. And she was wearing this thing like this, and it's a blue thing with two lenses. And I was able to tell from the picture of her what the name of the company was. So I sent away, and I got a pair, and they're great because especially for things like the more detailed pencil drawing. You put them on, and the tip of your pencil is like this big thing, and you you can see like, and then I got this thing. It has a lens this big, and it has a, a LCD lights on the back side of it facing down, and it has one of those arms like this, and it weighs a ton because it's glass. It's a glass lens, but I've I wind up getting bungee cords to keep it from falling down on me because. It, the table's slanted, so this thing is used to being on a straight table when you tilt the table. So I suspend it over me, and when you look through that, you are seeing such magnification. It's wonderful. So I did do a lot of detail work with that, and my eyesight's not the greatest. So, yeah. So, I want to expand on what you saw when you were looking at it, too. Like, what you were looking at must have kind of blown your mind a little bit too when you saw what it really looked like closer? Yeah. You're looking at an object like the original when you're looking at it under magnification. Yeah, you see so much more, you know, and, and you can actually sometimes see the combination of colors that when you back up make the actual color. And you can you can try to put those different colors in there. And uh, but it does sometimes when you come back out to the real real life outside of magnification I, there were areas where it's like, John, you're way overboard. Like when, once you get back, you can't see what you were doing in there. So don't, why are you doing it in there? You know. So it's getting a balance. But for detail work, it really is nice to be able to get those really exact little things. And magnification has worked for me this year. You know. but yes. Are you going to produce a book on this show? Um, I have a book in the works that will include this. It's going to be, um, there's a book that I had in 2006, and I've put together one from then till now, and I've, I'm getting about 100 pieces. It's kind of choosing 100 pieces. And I'm, I'm looking to get it done in one of those, uh, like a blurb type thing where you can have a hardcover, really nice. And I've seen books and made by a friend of mine. He made books like that. And they look really good. I'm going to examine them for how long lasting they'll be, because I don't know if they're cutting corners. But um, I want to get one made like that. This one I had printed in bulk in 2006, and I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> that roll of paper was nothing compared to dragging around books. So um, no, I'm going to, yeah, so I will, yep. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight with the rain and everything. I really appreciate it. It's so nice that you could be here. And I hope I answered your questions and gave you a little glimpse into the little world that we live in that makes the stuff. And, and I, I did want to, we talked earlier, and if any of you are ever up in the Denver Scotta area, we're two miles off Route 1, and feel free to give a call and come by the studio sometime if you're ever up in the neighborhood. So, yeah. Thank you.